demands for criminal charges are growing tonight after a New York subway confrontation turned deadly. We should warn you, the video you're about to see is disturbing. NBC's Stephanie Gosk has the story for us. Tonight, there is growing pressure on the Manhattan District Attorney to bring criminal charges after a man was choked to death on the subway Monday. He could not breathe. Jordan Neely ended up on the floor of the train in a headlock after police say an argument turned into a violent confrontation. When it was over, Neely was unconscious. EMS attempts to revive the 30-year-old failed. The medical examiner ruled his death a homicide by chokehold. So far, there are no criminal charges. The 24-year-old who held Neely in a headlock was taken into custody and then released, according to police. The video obtained by NBC New York shows Neely in a chokehold for nearly three minutes. The witness who took it says Neely got on the subway and was acting aggressively, telling riders he was hungry, he was thirsty, that he didn't care about anything. He didn't care about going to jail. He didn't care that he gets a big life sentence. Today, New York's governor called the chokehold a, quote, extreme response. There have to be consequences, and so we'll see how this unfolds, but uh, his family deserves justice. With me now to discuss is former New York prosecutor and civil rights attorney Charles Coleman. Charles, there have notably been no arrests, and many people out there want to know why. What's your take? Simone, I think the first thing that we have to understand in having a conversation about Mr. Neely in this case is that the perception of New York City is that we are a very progressive city that does not have issues regarding class and race. And that perception cannot be further than from the truth. This is a city where this has happened repeatedly. And if we think about violence against black people, we have unfortunately been at the epicenter of this, whether it's law enforcement or vigilante justice. You can think about what it was with Eric Garner. You can think about Amadou Diallo. You can think about Sean Bell. And that's just on the police side. But we've actually seen this sort of violence in the subway before. I want to remind viewers of a case of, uh, relating to Bernard Getz, which occurred way back in the 80s, some years ago, where a white man shot a, 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 a teenager on the train uh, because he felt threatened. This sort of thing happens in New York because we have issues of class and race that have not been dealt with and that are fault lines in our society. And the fact that we have had such a split among public officials in terms of how they've addressed this is, quite frankly, because it shines a light on some of the ills that take place in New York City around affordable housing, around inadequate mm -hmm. mental health services. And that's why we have this cauldron of, of different responses that has boiled to the surface around his death. You know, Charles, you you brought up the case from the 80s, and some legal experts are now saying about this particular case that it could get complicated for some of those same reasons, if passengers claim they felt threatened. And I'm going to put quotes around threatened, because this is something we often hear, or uh, if passengers claim that they, that they needed to act in self-defense. Talk a little... Can you just unpack this for us? And, and then also weigh in on why use a chokehold? I, I've watched right. this video now a number of times, and uh, Mr. Neely was, was strangled to death on that train. Well, unfortunately, Simone, you cannot divorce the notion of being threatened or the language of being threatened from the weaponization of race in a case like this, because at the end of the day, we have seen blackness weaponized in such a way that excuses or raises the level of threat that people are allowed to say they have when they are dealing with someone who is a black person versus when they are not. And so we've seen this movie before, and unfortunately, we know how it is. That is, in many people's minds, going to excuse an action or response of violence. And I think, overall, we have become desensitized to the notion of vigilante justice in the name of self-defense. For the past few weeks, we've been talking about people who have literally been using firearms, other deadly force, in terms of defending themselves or in their belief because they felt threatened, responding to these threats in a lethal manner. In this case, the person who is the, the, the assailant, the 24-year-old former Marine, is someone who chose a lethal means with his hand hands and his training to enact vigilante justice because he felt threatened. I am not of the belief that there was no other way to de-escalate this situation or deal with this conflict, even if you felt like you were threatened, than to exercise the deadly means of a chokehold. Mr. Neely should be alive, this individual should be arrested, and he has to have his day in court. Uh, Charles, 
I think this case says something about how uh, the public views unhoused people, how the legal system views unhoused people. I think the combination of race, uh, the combination of mental health is also uh, apparent here. You talk about the, the, the person who held Mr. Neely in a headlock. The police interviewed him. They released him. Why have charges not been filed? I think, Simone, you're talking about the issue of class and race in this intersection in a city that would like to purport itself to be far more progressive and far less problematic than it is. There are a class of people in New York City who cannot afford to live in New York City. Affordable housing is an issue. Inadequate mental health services, as I've already talked about, are issues. And so what happens is, when you have these marginalized sections of our community, of our society, of our city, they are treated in many respects as second-class citizens, not only by other New Yorkers, but by law enforcement themselves. And so the amount of attention that law enforcement is going to give absent public pressure, which is why protests, which is why social media, which is why these conversations are so important right now in order to keep the pressure on police, because absent that that pressure being applied, these people will be treated like second-class sec, second citizens because there is no one to advocate for them. In a city that is literally pricing people out of places to live and places to exist, there is no one who is going to advocate for these people when you're talking about the unhoused or when you're talking about people of mental health services or in need of those services. And so that's why you're seeing this conversation linger for as long as it has, because we are allowed to treat these people as though they are marginalized as second-class citizens, and that is a big problem. Charles Coleman, thank you so much.